So today, that dreaded inner critic. Um, we've all got one, haven't we, really? And it's can be the most hideous voice that is inside our head. And I'm going to share with you today, like, my journey with it, really, and, and how my relationship with that voice has changed over the last few years. So maybe you can relate to this. At one point, I had such a horrible, cruel voice inside my head. But not only was that voice inside my head, that voice would berate me or or I would self-berate with that voice out loud. So I would call myself stupid, idiot, um, all sorts of things um, out loud. Like it it was awful, really. And I remember uh, when I first got into self-development, hearing that thing of, well, you know, would you would you speak to a friend that way? And and I absolutely wouldn't. But I don't know that that voice was particularly friendly. <laughs> and so perhaps that wasn't the best analogy, really. Uh, maybe it wasn't as helpful as as it could have been. Um, and perhaps I, I think probably that I didn't actually um, find that particularly helpful. Although I did say it to other people. I remember saying it to other people myself, you know, don't speak to yourself uh, like that. You know, you wouldn't speak to a friend like that. But that voice is nothing to do with friendship and it's nothing to do with love. That voice is the voice of the past. It's nothing to do with anything that we would, could relate to, anything to do with friendship. So anyway, that was, that was how my voice used to be, very, very loud. And I think through some of my self-development work, I think what happened really was that I just sort of became aware that that I was doing it and that it wasn't very nice. And I think that helped, that helped. There was just some level of self-awareness th- that started me on this path to kind of go, oh, you know, that that's not very nice. You know, that's not very nice how I'm speaking to myself and starting to see the impact of that in terms of what I felt okay doing and how I felt okay sort of putting myself out there or being authentic to myself in the world but it didn't go away um it was still there yakking away in my head I I don't know if you've given yours a name but I sort of after it had gone away I think I started to give it a name I think if I'd given it a name when it was there it might have thought it was invited (laughs) So I didn't so much give it that voice, that name until afterwards and I, I then called it Niggly Nelly because it's it can be really niggly, can't it? It just can be just picking you up on every little thing that you apparently, and I'm putting this in inverted commas, that you apparently do wrong. Um, every little, just such trivial things really a lot of the time that it's picking us up on. And so niggly was I thought was a <laughs> was an appropriate word for it and and Nelly because well because I'm a primary school educator and um, alliteration is a thing <laughs> you know that's why I really niggly Nelly because it sounds good it sounds the alliteration sounds good doesn't it so how I imagine that voice that that she's like some drunken you know that that relative who's just not very nice to you who who at Christmas gets really drunk and sits in the corner of the room just sort of saying everybody looks, oh, you don't look very, you look a bit fat in that dress, Hilda, you know, and just like, <laughs> just says horrible things to people. And the drunker they get, the more horrible things they say. And I think for me, seeing it as a character was sort of helpful in a way because... First of all, it brought some humour to it. And I, I do like humour. I like things to be light-hearted. I'm not a very serious person. And I think as I started to go, oh, yeah, you know, it is just like a drunken, angry relative. That was helpful. And the other thing about that is that that really is what that voice is. As we grow up, we have this voice in our head that we think is us. We think that's who we are. We think that's our essence, we think it's true, we believe it all the time. But in actual fact, 
it is an angry drunk aunt in the corner or a critical teacher or a critical parent or a bully who told us we were such and such when we were younger. It is like a caricature. And so for me, making it into a caricature made it just seem like, well, why would I take that seriously? So let me explain that. And there's a process that goes on that I've called transference. So it's not some psychological term as far as I know. I've just kind of made it up, but I think it's helpful. As we're growing up, we're like little sponges and we're just picking up from our environment all this stuff, you know, that people, what, what people think is okay, what people think is not okay, what people think is okay about us and not okay, what's, what's not okay for us to be like, all the criticism and I think particularly for people you know that I work with who are often high achieving um, often have a very loud critical voice who experience that treat and mean keep them keen parenting which was very critical in a well-meaning way to make us tough and strong and to be able to handle the big horrible world um we we were just surrounded by criticism our schooling was very critical our parents were very critical now what happens in this process of transference is that we're sort of living in this environment where there's just voices saying things about us about other things about other people etc and we we just that just sort of transfers from being outside coming in you know a parent telling us we're rubbish or a parent telling us we could have done better or whatever to being the voice in our head without us even knowing that's going on that happens unconsciously it happens there's no deliberately nobody deliberately learning there's nobody deliberately doing any teaching but there is this continual learning process and i've actually seen this happen in real life with with a young child who is in my life or you know he's not so young now but when he was very little that that he he was quite heavily criticized by one of his parents and we we kind of knew some of the phrases that this woman was using and the mother and we one day we were talking to the child and we we knew there'd been this particular phrase about him being out of control and he, he, we asked him about something that he'd done and, he, and we said, well, why do you think you did that? And he said, oh, it's because I'm out of control. Now, that child probably didn't even remember that his mum had said that to him, but it came out of his mouth as if it was the truth. And I was like, my God, that, that's happened already. That's, you know, and imagine growing up believing that you're out of control as a as a belief about yourself you know we might call that a limiting belief because they're all the same thing you know the limiting beliefs the inner critic they are they're all the same type of thinking aren't they you know either we we're very critical of ourselves as we try to do things or we feel very limited and we you know by that voice and we can't even make a start on doing things so it's really i think it's just really useful to see where all this self-judgment, where all this criticism has actually come from in the first place. Because I don't want you to, to see that you, you've got to battle this or try and silence this voice. What I'm pointing to is just seeing it through a different lens, seeing it as a, in a different way through a, as a different, from a different perspective, really. That it's not... You know, it's not who you really are. That, that voice that you've been listening to, that you probably cannot remember it not being there, is not you. And that your essence, that, that which was there when you were a very small child, that was obvious to everybody around you when you were a very small child, and that is obvious to us when we spend time with small children, that freedom that self-expression, that, that aliveness is still there. And yes, the, the inner critical voice may be the loudest thing you can hear. But what if we just started to go, oh, hang on a minute. That's that voice again. That's not, that's not true. And again, as I keep stressing, 
there's a felt sense of when we are believing that in a critical voice, isn't there? Or there is just one of those um, fear responses, fight, flight, freeze, fawn. The inner critical voice can often have us take one of those paths or, or, or react in that fearful way. And we feel that in the body. And that's telling us that we are believing something that isn't true. We're believing that inner critical voice and it isn't true. And I think the more we sort of start to come more from that place of awareness, from that place of realising that's not who we really are, and we start to go, well, hang on a minute. That that voice I'm hearing, do I have to... Is it true? Do I have to take it seriously? You know, that is it true question is a really, really powerful one. Is, is it true? So really by understanding the nature of this inner critic, and that's what we're doing here, it's understanding the nature of thought, the nature of feelings, the nature of our experience... We just feel less inclined to believe it. And that's really, really powerful. So I really hope you found that helpful um, today. And sorry for the boring outfits. <laughs> you know, that's my critical voice, isn't it? At least you could get up and change your jumper. If you knew how long it took me to change my jumper in the critical voice, you would shut up. Um yeah, getting it over the pot and everything. So yeah, thank you for listening. Hopefully the content is not impacted on by me looking exactly the same for a few videos. As soon as I can get back outside um, into the fresh air and take some more videos in the sunshine um, or not <laughs> in, the, in the autumn drizzle, perhaps, um, I will definitely do that. But hopefully it's helpful anyway. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching and um, take care. Lots of love.